right, unit five, Abe, start us off. All right, so definitely know the definition of consciousness. That's an awareness of ourselves and our environment. There are various stages of consciousness that we enter and leave throughout a typical day, such as sleeping and then waking up. Let's start with sleep. Sleep is a periodic natural loss of consciousness. Approximately every 90 minutes, we complete a cycle through the five distinct stages. Stage one, we experience hallucinations, sometimes the sensation of free falling. Stage two, we exper experience sleep spindles, which are bursts of rapid brainwave activity, and we also sleep talk. In stage three and four, we begin to emit slow, large delta waves, and it's hard for us to be woken up. There's also REM sleep, or rapid eye movement sleep, which is named such because our eyes dart around in this stage and we begin to dream. As we cycle through the different stages of sleep, we also enter REM sleep periods throughout the night, which you can see in this graph. There are a few notable sleep disorders. Insomnia involves experience per experiencing persistent problems with falling or staying asleep. Narcolepsy is where you can randomly and uncontrollably fall into deep sleep, even if you're driving on a busy freeway. Dangerous. Dangerous. Sleep apnea is when you can stop breathing while you sleep, which will wake you up and thus damage the quality of your sleep over the night. Finally, night terrors. These are different from nightmares. Sleeping children will walk around, speak incoherently, and appear terrified. Let's make a few comments about why we dream. We dream to satisfy our own wishes, to express unconscious desires that we wouldn't want to express directly, like making out with our secret crush. We dream to improve memory, since dreams help us sort and fix experiences into our memories. And our dreams also reflect cognitive development. Dreams are part of our brain's process of maturing. Another state of consciousness is hypnosis, where the hypnotist suggests to the subject that the subject will experience some spontaneous thoughts or behaviors. Anyone can experience hypnosis, but people who tend to become absorbed in imaginative activities are the most hypnotizable. But Abe, does hypnosis really qualify as an altered state of consciousness? There's no clear answer to that question. Some researchers say that hypnotic behavior is just an extension of everyday social behavior in that the more the subject likes and trusts the hypnotist, the more he will allow the hypnotist to direct his fantasies. Mm, yeah, but other researchers like Ernest Hilgard argue that hypnosis represents a split between different levels of consciousness, a state of disassociation. For example, when a hypnotized person sticks his arm into an ice bath, the hypnosis disassociates the sensation of the pain from the emotional suffering that usually comes with experienced pain. I have a few comments to make about drugs. There are three major categories of psychoactive drugs, depressants, stimulants, and hallucinogens, all of which affect the brain synapses by mimicking, stimulating, or inhibiting neurotransmitters. Depressants. They slow body functions and calm neural activity, and they include alcohol, barbiturates or tranquilizers, and opiates like heroin. Stimulants arouse body functions and excite neural activity, and they include caffeine, nicotine, cocaine, and ecstasy. So depressants and stimulants are opposites. Hallucinogens are also known as psychedelics, and they evoke sensory images in the absence of sensory input and can also distort our perceptions. Hallucinogens include LSD, also known as acid, and marijuana. At the end of the day, all these psychoactive drugs share a common feature. While they have immediate positive effects, they cause very negative after effects that get worse with each repeated use. Hence, we have the common saying, don't do drugs, kids. So Frank, are we going to learn about Unit 6 or what? <laughs> I'm glad you asked, Abe, because Unit 6 is all about learning. Now, learning here means a relatively permanent behavior change due to experience. And Myers delves into three types of learning. 
classical conditioning, operant conditioning, and observational learning. First, let's talk about classical conditioning, pioneered by Ivan Pavlov in the 1920s. Pavlov, a Russian scientist, rang a bell every time he fed his dogs. Ring, ring, ring. Time to eat. After a while, the dogs began to salivate in response to the bell rather than the food. This is a simple example of classical conditioning. To quickly brush on some, uh, on some terminology, Pavlov showed the dogs food, which is a stimulus causing dogs to salivate. Because dogs always salivate from food, we call the food unconditioned stimulus. The bell, which Pavlov rung at the same time as introducing the food, is a neutral stimulus that the dogs learn to associate with food. As the dogs built the association between the food and bell, the bell became a conditioned stimulus, causing salivation in dogs. These same mechanisms underpin other important concepts such as learned helplessness and higher order conditioning. And here we have another example in case the dog one wasn't clear, this time with a crying baby and a mouse. Next up, we have operant conditioning, where animals learn to associate their own actions with responses. The important scientist here is B.F. Skinner, creator of the Skinner box, which we see in front of us here. The box contains a bar that the rats inside can pull to disperse pellets. And what we saw was that, over time, the rats got faster and faster to pull the lever when they were hungry. In other words, they learned that pulling the lever gave them food. Operant conditioning like this is extremely good at shaping and reinforcing behaviors, and we commonly use negative and positive reinforcements with our children and pets. Researchers have also observed that varying the reinforcement schedules, in other words, how often the rat gets food from pressing the bar, has a role to play in conditioning. For example, if the bar only yields food one half of the time, the rat will learn much slower. The third and final form of learning we'll cover is learning by observation. This type of learning occurs without experience, unlike the first two. And we only see it occur in smarter animals like humans, monkeys, and octopus. That's because we have a thing that most animals do not, and that's motor or mirror neurons. These are neurons that fire in reaction to our peers' behaviors and emotion. It's why we're scared when we watch horror movies, and why we wince when we see others get hurt. These principles were first uncovered by psychologist Albert Bandura in 1961. In his famous Bobo doll experiments, Bandura had some preschool kids watch adults punch, kick, and yell at the doll, basically a big pinata. He then put a bunch of kids alone in a room with only crappy toys and the doll, and all the kids that had seen the adults attack the doll also attacked the doll as well. This showed that violence and aggression could also be learned through observation with interesting implications for TV and video games. So, to come full, uh, full circle here, we first looked at classical conditioning. The example here would be the boss plays the song Sweet Home Alabama on the speakers when he hands out bonuses. And now whenever you hear the song Sweet Home Alabama, you're in a really great mood. Uh, second was operant conditioning. Example would be a boss gives an employee a bonus every time the employee turns in a report early. So that means that the employee is gonna return in employee uh, reports early very commonly. And finally, observational learning. An employee learns how to give presentations by watching their more experienced superiors. So the three types of learning that Myers covers. Memory. That's learning that has lasted over time. It's information that can be stored and retrieved. There are three stages of memory. Encoding, getting information into our brain. Storage, retaining that information. And retrieval, getting the information back out. Let's start with encoding. Our brains are capable of parallel processing or processing many aspects of a problem at the same time. You might engage in effortful processing or encoding that requires conscious effort if you're trying to learn some new vocab words. But the fact that you might also remember the layout of the page in your notebook 
on which a certain vocab word and its definition were written is evidence of automatic processing or unconscious encoding of information. The amount of information you remember depends on the amount of time you spent learning and on if you made the information meaningful. For example, actors memorize large scripts by understanding the flow of meaning in their lines. An actor might say, okay, this part of the dialogue is meant to flatter. This part is to make my friend comfortable. And this last part is to assuage his concerns. Chunking or organizing information into familiar manageable units also helps with memory. Mnemonics are one form of chunking. So if I was having trouble remembering the names of all the girls who rejected Frank when he asked them out last night, I could just remember Bishop, Brittany, Isabel, Sarah, Hannah, Olivia, Paula. Hey man, Hannah almost said yes. I don't think so. Let's move on to storage. The theme here is that our short-term memory sucks while, while our long-term memory is very powerful. Limitless capacity. Yes. We only retain about four information chunks in our short-term memory at a time. So if I gave you a list of four objects like soda, tree, cup, cereal, you'd probably be able to repeat the list back to me, but it becomes increasingly difficult as the list stretches on but beyond four information chunks. chunks. On the other hand, our capacity for long-term memory is limitless. Our brains don't have a storage limit, uh, like a limit where after we have to delete old memories to make room for new ones. And by studying victims of amnesia or memory loss, we've drawn a distinction between implicit and explicit memory. Implicit memory is remembering how to do something, like ride a bike even though you might not consciously know that you know how to do this activity if you have something like amnesia. Explicit memory is the ability to declare that you know something. For example, when people with amnesia read a story for a second time, they'll read it faster, which demonstrates implicit memory. But if we ask them if they've read the story before, they'll say no, demonstrating that they lack explicit memory. Note that the hippocampus is essential for processing explicit memories for storage, while the cerebellum is key for storing implicit memories. Finally, let's cover retrieval. Think of your memory like a spider web. Each piece of information is interconnected with many others, and when you encode information into memory, you associate it with other pieces of information about your seating position, your mood, and your surroundings. These pieces serve as retrieval cues, basically anchor points you can start from to ultimately access the information you want to retrieve. The more retrieval cues you have, the better your memory of the target information. Context also influences our memory retrieval. If you memorize vocab words in a library study room, it'll be easier for you to remember them in that room than it will back at home. And if Frank gets sad because yet another girl rejects him, he'll be more likely to recall other sad memories in his gloomy state, like when he was the first person in the world to score a zero on the AP Psych exam. Hey, that's not true. Maybe. Any discussion of memory wouldn't be complete without some notes on forgetting. There are three types of forgetting, encoding failure, storage decay, and retrieval failure. Encoding failure occurs when we don't put enough effort into processing information into our memories. Storage decay describes how after learning something, we initially forget a lot of it quickly, and then our retention levels off. And you can see this behavior in the curve on the slide. Retrieval failure occurs when information is in our memory, but we can't access it since we don't have enough information to retrieve it. Basically, we can't find a retrieval cue. Dave, you know your state capitals, right? Of course. What's the state capital of Arizona? What is, is it, it, Abe? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Another note. Misinformation can change the construction of our memory. If someone sees a light car accident, but is then asked leading questions suggesting a more severe accident, such as 
how fast were the cars moving when they smashed into each other. This person will actually begin to remember the accident as being more violent than it actually was. And this is called the misinformation effect. So let's look even deeper into the bag of tricks our mind employs to effectively remember our experiences and form judgments on what's going on around us. We form concepts or mental groupings of similar objects, events, ideas, and people. These are general groupings such as silverware or houses, and we subdivide them into different categories. A prototype is our conceptually perfect example of the category. When you think of silverware, you probably thought of a fork, knife, and spoon. When I say African animal, you probably think of an elephant, lion, or giraffe. They're the most fundamental thing we associate with the category, and everything else in that category shares traits with that prototype to varying degrees. Our brain uses a variety of strategies to assist in problem solving as well. Algorithms are the first of these. They're a step-by-step -step procedure that guarantees a solution. But we also use plenty of heuristics, which make choices easier by reducing the choice set. They're generally informed by experience. The other day, Abe and I went to the grocery store to pick up eggs. I didn't know where the eggs were, so I walked down every single aisle until I found the eggs. I was using an algorithm. <laughs> like a dummy. I knew that the eggs would have to be refrigerated, so I only walked to the aisles that were refrigerated and found the eggs a lot quicker. I used a heuristic and got the answer faster. Creativity is yet another valuable characteristic of our thinking abilities. We can produce novel and original ideas after achieving certain levels of aptitude in a given field. Factors such as intrinsic motivation, creative environment, and imaginative mindset help fuel valuable creative thinking. They also help us overcome the mental obstacles that sometimes hinder our problem-solving abilities. These obstacles themselves are pretty interesting. Fixation is a good example. It's our inability to see a problem from a new perspective. For example, if you forget to bring a screwdriver, you may forget that a coin or butter knife could work just as well. Even our strategies can push us the wrong way. The availability heuristic occurs when we form judgments off recent or especially striking images while forgetting all the other information that we know. An example is the decline in air travel after 9-11. People began to drive instead of flying, even though statistically, driving was still more dangerous. Finally, let's discuss language, the tool that allows humans to communicate our stories and knowledge across time and distance. The building blocks of all languages are distinctive basic sounds called phonemes. The word run has three phonemes, r, uh, n. Bank has four. B, A, N, K. Thank you, Frank. We understand. <laughs> You're welcome, Abe. This is important, though. Um, and, mo and morphemes, on the other hand, are the smallest unit of a language that carry meaning. Now, these are all either monosyllabic words, such as run and cat, and they're also prefixes and suffixes, like uh, ED, which makes things past tense, or ING, that makes our words present tense. We then arrange these using a set structure of rules, aka grammar, and that's basically what language is. We learn languages in different stages as we develop, and thus it shouldn't be surprising to learn that language also influences the way we think. Because the Hopi Native Americans have no past tense, they have difficulty talking about things in the past. Varying theories exist for how we learn language, some say we learn through a variation of observation and copying others, mixed with positive reinforcement. Others, notably Noam Chomsky, argue we are born with innate language skills. <laughs>